Hey, it's good to see you. This is a video I already made earlier when I was driving to Target in High Point, and I took the long scenic route so I'd have more time to talk. But then, as I mentioned in my previous video, that, that video is just busted. I've tried every thing I know to open it and there's it's just like corrupted or something it's just busted so anyway the second half I recorded on my way back from high point that video is fine and I've made several videos since then that, you know just to test it out they're all fine no problem so I don't know what happened I have no idea but it seems to be okay so I was gonna tell you about my my time with Eckerd drugs and, uh, and I worked at, I started out working at Eckerd's, one of the Eckerd locations in um, Wilmington back in the early 90s when I was going to school at UNC Wilmington. Now the first year I was in college for the first, my freshman year, I didn't have a car because the car I had died on graduation night when I was in the 12th grade and it never started again. So I could not afford to get another car right away so I worked the summer after my freshman year in a factory. I worked at Black & Decker making um, toaster ovens six and sometimes seven days a week. I would work and uh, saved up some money and put a down payment on a car. And my mom had to co-sign because I was still only 18 and I didn't really have a credit history or anything. So, um, yeah, so anyway. When I got back down to Wilmington to start my sophomore year that fall, um, I applied for several jobs and I ended up taking the one at uh, Eckerd. It's kind of funny because I also applied for this job at a restaurant called the Pickle Barrel. And I remember that, that I remember putting in an application and it was kind of like, well, we don't need anybody, but we'll let you know. And you know, that, that everybody says that. You don't think anything of it. Four years later, when I was getting ready to graduate, randomly, every now and then, I would still get a call from that restaurant, seeing if I was still interested in a job, and I had to keep telling them no. Like, I, I put in an application there like four years ago, <laughs> but they, periodically, throughout the whole four years, they just kept calling me. <laughs> so I never took a job at the Pickle Barrel. Maybe I should have. Maybe that was Fate's way of trying to say, you need to work at the Pickle Barrel. I never did. Anyway, um, so I started working at Eckerd's up front. I worked up front to start, and the reason I was most interested in working there was because they were willing to work with me, because I told them at the interview, I said, now I am in college. My schedule is going to change every semester. You know, I'll try to schedule all my classes in the mornings, but if I have to take an evening class, you know, is that going to be a problem? And they said, don't worry about it. We'll work around it. No big deal. And they did, they, well, for the most part, um, worked with me on that. So I started out working up front in the camera department, which is just the front of the store. And they called it the camera department because back then, this was back in the early 90s again, where people would drop off film. I know some of you young people may have heard of it. You would take pictures on a little 110 camera or a 35 millimeter or whatever, and you would have these rolls of film. And you would take them into a place like Eckerd's and they had this little kiosk up front with these little envelopes and you would write your name and address on there and what kind of prints you wanted and drop the film in there and seal it up. And then in a few days, your pictures would come back and you'd come in and pay for them. Well, that was one of the, the things that you had to do when you worked up front. You had to keep all the, the pictures sorted. We had this little thing back behind the counter with all the pictures sorted in these alphabetized bins, you know, and, and I loved when the pictures would come in and you'd have to add new pictures and you'd have to make sure they were alphabetized and all neat, you know. I love doing that. I love making order out of chaos. It's always very satisfying to me. So I started out just being a cashier up front, but when you're a cashier in a store like that, you, you run the register, you put out stock, you answer the phone, you help customers find things, you know, you help customers with their film and their pictures. I mean, you kind of just have to do whatever. You're just sort of a jack of all trades. So I did that um, for about a year. And I mainly, th there were two assistant managers. The main manager guy only worked during the day. I almost never saw him. Usually by the time I came in, he was gone. I would usually come in around six or so and work till 11 or 12 o'clock at night. 
Most of the Eckerd's in Wilmington were open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. The store I worked at was different though. We were open from 8 a.m. to midnight, seven days a week. And most of the other stores in town were not like that. So a lot of other stores, even like Walmart and Target, a lot of those stores closed at nine back then. So whenever anybody needed anything between nine and 12, they would come into the Eckerd's where I worked. And sometimes it got really busy. But it was, it was fine. I was working anywhere from 20 to 30 hours a week. And here's this thing they would do, and it's, I think it's really messed up. Okay, now back then, and a lot of stores are like this. You know, Walmart gets a lot of grief for the way they treat their employees, but a lot of other stores do this kind of stuff too. Back then, when I, was wor when I started working there, they told me that anybody who worked under 35 hours a week was considered on call. You weren't even considered part-time. You were considered on-call. And I would work anywhere from 30 to 34.9 hours a week. Like, they would keep me right under that 35-hour mark every week. <clears throat> if you worked 35 up to 40 hours a week, you were considered part-time. And if you worked 40 or more hours, you were full-time. Part-time people got a few benefits. Full-time people got some benefits. Very few employees were part-time or, or full-time. I would say the vast majority of their employees were like me. They were on call. And if you're on call, you get no benefits. You get no vacation time, no insurance. You get nothing beyond your straight hourly pay. And I was on call the entire time. So I never, I never got anything for the three years I worked there other than my straight hourly pay. But again, I stayed because I needed a job that would be willing to work with me when my schedule changed every semester. You see, but it was very important to me that I would have that flexibility. And they did work with me on that. So I worked with two assistant managers for the most part. One I worked with probably 95% of the time and the other guy maybe 5%. He usually didn't work at night. Every now and then he would. We'll call them uh, Mark and John. No, no, we'll call them John and Robert. I'm trying to, I think I talked about him in the second video and I gave him some names. So, okay, John is the one I worked with the most. He was the one, and, and John, it was like he was always there. It's like he worked seven days a week. He was always there when I came in and he was still there when I left. Like, do you ever go home? Now, John was kind of a, it's not really a good word for him. He was just kind of a jerk. He was kind of a pervy jerk. I mean, I don't, he was, he was a jerk on multiple levels. It's like he found different ways to be a jerk. And uh, he would say things to me that looking back, it's like, that was straight up sexual harassment. It was sexual harassment. But I, I'm like 18, you know, when I started working there, I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't realize that that was something that I should have reported. I didn't know. He would, he would say things like, you know, I would come in and he'd go, wow, that's a nice top. That looks so good on you. It really hugs you in the right spots. And it just made me feel yucky. Just like, oh, because this guy, I was, so I was 18 when I started working there. And this guy was maybe early to mid 30s. And it's just, he was just kind of, bleh. Like, oh man. And it just made me feel gross when he would say stuff like that because, and it would embarrass me, you know, because I, I was very shy. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't do well with people talking to me like that. And it would make me blush. And then he would laugh at me. He thought it was funny, you know, like, oh, you're so innocent. Are you a virgin? He would just ask me this stuff, right? And, um, it was awful. I hated it. So I would have to deal with him like that. And he would get onto me for every little thing. And, uh, and he was the one I had to work with most of the time. And, uh, you know, he would go for a while and not do it. And then he would start doing it again. And it's like he had no life. He was always just at work. And, like, working was all he ever did, apparently. And he was a bit on the short side. And I think he was kind of touchy about it. Although nobody else was ever said anything about it. Like, he was very self-conscious. So he might have been, like, five foot five, maybe. And I think it bothered him. So... And uh, I was, I'm taller than him. And he would always say, well, I like tall women because I can climb them. Like, dude, you know, looking back, he was a lot like Carl. He really did sound a lot like, 
Carl. He, this stuff he said sounded like stuff Carl would say. Anyway, so I had to work with him. The only good thing about working with John, though, was that he wouldn't take any crap from the customers. Like, he would not let the customers come in and just bully their way around. And if you've ever worked in retail, you know how important it is to have a, a, a boss or a supervisor or whoever that has your back, you know, that will stick up for you when a customer tries to start something and, and they are in the wrong because the customer is not always right. I don't know who told them that, but no, they're not. And um, we, the store was in like kind of a more wealthy part of town. And there were a lot of very self-important people who would come in there with the attitude of, do you, do you not know who I am? Do you not know who my husband is? You know, I spend more in here in a week than you make in a year. Well, then, like, like why, are you, why are you dickering over a $1 item then? You know, but they would want special discounts. They would pick up an item and say, this is on sale, you know, and I can't remember if I included this in the first part or the second part. So if I repeat myself later, I apologize. They would pick up something. I think I did mention it in the second part like an item that was $10 and a smaller one that was on sale for two. And they would pick up the $10 item and say, this is $2. And I'm like, you know, damn well, it's not. That's not on sale for $2. And, you know, yeah, John would, John would stand up to him and say, no, you can get the smaller one. You're not getting that for $10. And they would pitch a fit. And he's like, I don't care. That's the heat. It's every day, Mary. I don't give a shit. I got somewhere I got to go. I would get up and turn the heat down, but I got, I got, I got shit to do. I wasn't planning on having to re-record this. Um, so I worked in the camera department for a year. And then at, at night, there was this lady who worked back in the pharmacy, and she worked most of the nights that I was there. Well, she ended up getting engaged. Did I explain? I think I explained all this. I, it was in the first part. So she got engaged and moved to, like, Michigan or something. And they offered me the, the pharmacy position back there because it was basically the same hours and I had expressed an interest in, you know, doing something else because, you know, like, you got anything else? I loved working in the cosmetics department. There was a lady who worked in the cosmetics department during the day. Her name was Odessa and she was so awesome. I loved her. She grew up in um, the Tidewater, Virginia area and she had that beautiful accent that they have there. Oh, I, I loved Odessa, and she was so awesome, and I loved working with her. Anyway, I would have loved to work there, but there was nobody working in that part of the store at night. So I took the, the pharmacy position back there, and I got to learn how to, you know, get in prescriptions and the information they needed on the prescription, and, you know, this. At that time, our stores were not linked electronically. Everything was on paper in the individual stores which I would have to explain to customers because CVS at that point was was linked, I think, already by computer. So if you had a prescription in one store, they could easily access it at any CVS. Well, at that point, you couldn't do that at Eckerd. You, they, you, one store would have to call the other and they would have to transfer the prescription. So it was a real pain for a lot of customers. And they would get mad and take it out on you. And that was another thing I didn't like about working at night was I would usually come in around six or so and you know, so I'm just starting my shift and you have people who are getting off work and like you have somebody who's had a bad day and they come in and they've got a chip on their shoulder already and they're just like, they're looking for something to blow up about and they take it, they take their bad day out on you. And that was the good thing about John was that he wouldn't tolerate it for, with me or any, not just me, but for any of us. Like if, an, if a customer was showing their butt and being a, you know, just being a jerk, he'd call them out on it. Like, is there something I can help you with? No, then you need to calm down. You need to settle down. And I did appreciate him doing that. Now the other guy, Robert, no, he wouldn't get involved. He would just conveniently disappear. If there was ever any kind of drama or anything going on, you couldn't find Robert. Robert would just vanish. It's like he had a hole to another universe and he would just disappear until the drama was over. Like you couldn't find him. You'd page him, he wouldn't come. And you find out later he was back in the break room while there had a little TV in there. He's back in there watching TV with the door shut. Like, I knew damn well you heard that. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you paging me? I didn't. I, I was taking my break. Like, 
you're always taking your break when stuff happens. It's kind of weird. I didn't like working with him. I mean, he seemed like a nice enough guy, but he was very spineless. Not a good manager. You can't be like that. You know, you cannot just completely avoid confrontation if you're a manager. You just can't. So I, I didn't like working with him, but at least he wasn't pervy and a jerk. You know, he was a nice person. He never said pervy stuff, but he was just no help. He was useless when it came to anything that you actually needed him for. So, um, but yeah, so I started working back at the pharmacy. And at, the, at that time, and I don't know how it is now, well, I don't think Eckerd's even exists anymore. Maybe they do. I don't know. Because Eckerd's got gobbled up after I left by Rite Aid, and then the Rite Aid's got gobbled up by CVS, so they're now all... I don't know. I think there are still some Rite Aids out there. I could, I don't, I don't know. Around here, I think all the Rite Aids here are CVS stores now. So you got CVS and Walgreens, and like basically all the drug stores are Walgreens or CVS, which kind of sucks. Um, there are some independent drug stores, but nowhere near as many as there used to be. So anyway, back then, if somebody calls the store. We didn't have the automated, you know, welcome to Eckerd, please press one for blah. To, we didn't have that. If you worked back in the pharmacy, you had to answer all the phone calls and you'd have to direct the calls. See, so some nights you spend a lot of time on the phone, especially when there was bad weather and living on the coast, you have a lot of hurricanes and stuff. So people were constantly calling to see if the store was open. You have to keep stopping to answer the phone. And John always expected me to be there no matter what the weather was like. Like, you know, we'd have a hurricane come through, all the streets are flooded, and he's on the phone calling me, you coming in, right? Well, yeah, if I can find a canoe, I'll be there. And I would always get there. I was just praying the whole way, like, please let me not get swept away in this water in my little car. But I always made it. But he, the way he saw it, you never had a reason to not be at work. I had to leave work once because I was sick. I had strep, and I was sick as a dog. And I just, I could not, I could barely hold my head up. And I said, I have to go home. And he fussed at me. He threatened to write me up. I said, write me up. I mean, I don't think you want me here spreading cooties to everybody. He was such a jerk and he was a pervert and he was just a horrible little man. And uh, so once I started working back in the pharmacy, I didn't have to deal with him quite as much because he was usually busy up front, which was great. Um, and I love, that's when I first started organizing the over-the-counter stuff, like the aspirin and the, the Robitussin. And, and I would hear the pharmacists talking to people about these things. And I learned a lot. My favorite thing was straightening the shelves and making everything look pretty. So um, I, I worked back there. And the good thing about it, too, was you had a better uniform. Because when you worked up front, this was my other pet peeve, when you work up front, back then, you had to wear this ugly blue, it was like kind of like an apron thing. It was like an apron sort of thing. And it had Eckerd embroidered on it. And it was like a dark, like a dark blue, not navy blue, it was like a dark blue. It had a little name tag on it, you know. And every Saturday, but in the pharmacy, you got to wear a nice little zip up white coat, which was super cool. And I even got a better name tag. Um, I apologize if I repeat this in the second one. I don't remember what I said when. But uh, I don't think I talked about this. The one thing that really, really irked me, other than the people that came in there and, you know, like, do you know who I am? I'm like, no, and I don't care who you are. <laughs> it's the same price for you as everybody else. But uh, people would come up to me, and I, every Saturday morning I would have to come in and set the sale, which we didn't have scanners. Everything had a price sticker on it. And I had to manually place stickers on everything and I would pull down all the old sale tags and the sale stickers and I had the circular for the next sale and I would go around and put up all the new sale signs and put price tags on everything. So I could be in the middle of doing this wearing my Eckerd apron with my Eckerd name tag with an Eckerd pricing gun holding an Eckerd tote with Eckerd sale stuff in it and people walk up to me and go, do you work here? <sighs> And that it happened, I'd say it happened three or four times a week. I could, I could be behind the counter doing like going through the pictures and, and ringing people up and somebody, and I, even then people would ask me if I worked there, what the hell do you think? And usually I would, I would bite my tongue and say, yes, I do. I work here. Can I help you? But every now and then if I was just in an extra salty mood. 
somebody would go, do you work here? And I just go, I just look them dead in the eye and go, no, and just walk away. And I got in trouble for that once. I did. I was, I was, I still remember where I was when this woman approached me. I was down on the floor. I was kneeling down and I was putting sales stickers on bottles of shampoo. And I'm, I'm squatted down on the floor. I've got my, my Eckerd smock, my Eckerd pricing gun. You know, I've got Eckerd price stickers stuck on my arm where I was pulling them off. And then I pit and put them in the basket. Do you work here? And I just turned around and looked at her and said, no, I do not. And I just went right back to work. And I heard her grumbling as she walked away. And she went and told John what I said. She, your girl said that she, I asked her if she worked here. And she said no. Like, are you looking for a reason to be upset? Are you looking for something? What was the purpose of this exchange? So he, he wrote me up for being disrespectful to a customer. Like, oh no, I might lose my $4.20 an hour job. Like, you're not going to let me go. I said, yes, I, yes, I, because he asked me about it. He said, did you say that? I said, yes, I did. Because that was, with all due respect, John, that was a stupid question. And I think it deserved a stupid answer. So he wrote me up. I had to apologize to her. I'm sorry, ma'am. And she had this smug look on her face like, yeah, I know you are. I made you say sorry. <laughs> There were a lot of people that shopped there that had that, that were like that. It was, oh my God. I'm going to tell you, if you work in retail, I, especially now, because I think people with cell phones are even more rude. I, I feel for you because I, I, my God, I would, I would go back to it. If I had to, I would do it. But I, I, I feel for anybody that has to deal with that every day. I, I could, mm. I don't think I could do it. People ask me if I work there so often, eventually, I took a little post-it note and I wrote, yes, comma, I do work here. And I stuck it to my name tag and put tape on it. And more than a few times I had to point at it. And they might have grumbled, but I, I told John, cause he saw it and he said, what is that? I said, I'm tired of people asking me if I work here. And he said, you can't leave that on there. I said, I'm not being disrespectful. If I just point at this, I'm not being disrespectful to anyone and you can't write me up for that. They can, I did not alter the tag. I did not damage the tag. <clears throat> you can read my name on it. No harm, no foul. But the good thing was once I started working back in the pharmacy, that didn't happen much anymore. When I had on the white coat, they never asked me that. It was so weird going from the blue smock to the white jacket. They didn't ask me that as much anymore. I almost never got asked that after that. It was great. So I worked back there. Um, there was a whole bunch of other stuff I told, I said in that video now. I can't remember what it was. I do apologize. I'm sad too. So I worked there. Let's see what went on. Oh, I have to tell you about the time that I quit. Now this was um, when I was working. I think I was working. Yeah, I would have been probably a junior in college at this point. And this is when I also made the rule for myself to not date coworkers. Um, because I, I had this coworker, we'll call him Anthony, and Anthony was hot. He was unbelievably just a beautiful man. Oh my Lord, he was beautiful to look at. He didn't have a lot going on upstairs. Bless his heart, he was kind of an airhead, and that's why it didn't last. Like, because eventually you have to talk to him, and there was just nothing there, and like. We had nothing in common. You know, he was very vain. I was not allowed to touch his hair. He worked out obsessively. He was very muscular. You know, he was very into nutrition and fitness, which is great. But there was really nothing else to him. He was kind of an airhead, for lack of a better word. He just was. Um, so it was a very short-lived relationship. And then he started dating a friend of mine who lived downstairs from me. And so it was super awkward at work and when I was at home because I still saw his car in the parking lot and I knew he was at her house and like we couldn't really hang out anymore because it was just weird. And yeah, I would never date a coworker. I never did after that. It was like, mm -mm. so there's this, okay, so Anthony did some modeling on the side and um, he found out about, he had this agent and they found out that there was this store, this was around pr uh, prom time. And there was a store in the mall that was going to do a fashion show 
of all of their formal wear. They had all these beautiful dresses and, you know, tuxes and things and, you know, formal wear kind of stuff. And Anthony was going to be in it, and I got a chance to do, to do it as well. I talked to his agent. She said, yeah, I'll get you in there, no problem. So what I found out was they said, okay, well, it's going to be on this Saturday. We're going to need you here, you know, at 9 a.m. We're going to do your hair. We're going to, you know, get you fitted, make sure everything fits and everything looks good. We're going to give you a general idea of how this is going to go. And it was a whole thing. And you're going to be here basically, just plan to be here on over into the afternoon. No problem. Well, see, I normally worked on Saturdays. I worked every Saturday. It was my job to set the sale for the week on Saturdays. And uh, so, but I had three weeks notice. This, this thing was three weeks out. So I, once I found out about it and knew when it was going to be, I came in and I told John, I said, John, I've got a thing that I need to go to three weeks from now on a Saturday. I need to go ahead and see about getting somebody to switch shifts with me or something so I can have that day off. And he just, I still remember, we were in the office and he had his feet up on the desk and he was just leaning back in his chair and he's just looking at me and he goes, no. And he just looked at me and didn't say anything else. I said, but I have to be somewhere. He said, oh, you better be here because you work on Saturdays. And I said, but I know I work every Saturday. I never ask for a Saturday or a Sunday off, but I'm saying that three weeks from now I have a thing that I really want to do and I can't be here that day because normally I'd work nine to five. So he said, well, you better be here. I have a frog in my throat. I'm all right. So I said, but it's like we were playing a game of chicken and I said, but I, I can't be here. Because I, I am going to go do this thing. Well, that's up to you. I mean, you can show up to work like you're supposed to, or I can write you up for being absent. Because you are scheduled, you will be scheduled to work and you will work that day. I said, but I'm asking well in advance. He said, well, I don't care. You're, you're going to be here. And looking back, I really should have talked to his boss, and I found that out later, that I should have gone to him, but it didn't occur to me, because I was always told for scheduling stuff, I was supposed to talk to John to work out scheduling issues. So I didn't know. So anyway, you know, gets, we get to two weeks out, one week out, and I'm still telling him every day, like, I got that thing on this Saturday, you know, this date on the calendar. I, I don't care. You're going to be scheduled to work that day, just like you always are. And I try. I said, I, I'm willing to switch shifts with anybody. I don't care. I, I will swap the time out with somebody else. No, no, you won't. You're going to be here on Saturday. So that morning came, and I called I called the store when they opened at 8. And I said, okay, John, I'm just letting you know I won't be there this morning. He said, all right, well, I'm going to write you up then. And just right at that moment, I just I just had it. I said, you know what, while you're at it, Put down that this is my two weeks notice as well. Just go ahead and, and, and put that down while you're writing me up. Put down that this is also my two week notice. He said, you're not serious. I said, I am. I've never asked for a day off. I've never had any problem coming in, nights, weekends, holidays, whatever you need. This is the only time I've ever asked for a day off. And if this is the way you're gonna be, put down my two week notice, I'm out of there. I'll give you two more weeks and I'm out. Well, I went to the fashion show. It was quite spiffy. I had a great time. <laughs> I got to wear some cool stuff. And it was, it was, oh, it was so much fun. It was so fun. I had the best day. And, um, and I think for payment, all they gave us was like a gift certificate to buy something in the store. I think I ended up using it to buy like a dress or something. I don't know, like a fancy dress, but like just a regular dress. Um, yeah, that was our payment. That was fine with me. I didn't care. I, I had fun. I enjoyed the day. They had people there to do our hair and our makeup and everything. Oh, it was so fun. I loved it. Um, I was not, I had no regrets. Like, I don't care. I don't care. This is so great. So I came into work the next day and, you know, I'm like, well, I'm here. And John's like, well, I'm surprised to see you. Why? I'm, I'm here. I told you I just needed one day. 
you weren't serious about that two week thing where you I said I absolutely was do you need it in writing because I'll write it down oh I definitely need it in writing yeah because it's not official if you don't write it down so I said okay fine I'll write it out give it to you and I worked out my two weeks and I said, I'm out bye and during after I left that job I already already had another job lined up I had a job at food line briefly and I also worked for three weeks as a janitor at Laney High School where Michael Jordan went to school. I was a janitor there for three weeks. It was just like a temp job. Um, that filled the gap because I couldn't start at Food Line right away. So that filled the gap in there. So, and then right after that three weeks ended, I started my job at Food Line. Um, that job didn't go too well. That was a weird group of people. It was very, I, I felt very unwelcome. It was strange. Have you ever worked somewhere where it's like, it's like a club and you're not in it. Like all the employees are in this little club and you're just not part of it and they don't talk to you and you feel very weird. I worked there for about six weeks and it was really, really super uncomfortable. I did not like it. And they also were not super willing to work with my schedule for school. But during this whole two month period, um, the main manager at that at Eckerd's kept calling me and calling me like, Mary, please, please call me back. I want to talk to you about, you know, you coming back. You know, I'm really sorry. I found out what happened. That was totally, he was totally out of line. He should not have done that. I wish you would come to talk to me about it. If you needed a day off, I would have made it happen. I'm like, so I, I finally agreed to go talk to him. And I, I, do, I agreed to come back to work there. They gave me a tiny raise. I probably could have gotten more, but I, I didn't know my worth at that point. So I didn't really feel like I had the right to ask for more. I just got a little bit, very little bit. And I went back to work there. So for the three years, I was out for two two months, but went back to work in the pharmacy and I set the sale every Saturday. I worked Christmas day, three years in a row, you know, and it was, it was some, um, and, and, and John was very frosty towards me for quite a while after that. I think he got scolded. He was forced to apologize. So he was in the position that I had been put in before where you could tell he wasn't sorry because he was just like, sorry. I said I was sorry. He was not sorry. And he was very frosty to me, which was fine, because that meant he wasn't making pervy comments to me, but he was very critical of everything I did, very picky and critical of everything for the longest time. And um, so I, I was not sorry to leave that place. I lived in Wilmington for four years, and I was really ready to go. I, I was ready to go. Nothing against Wilmington, but it's just not for me. I was ready to move move away. Um, and that takes me from, so after I graduated from UNC Wilmington, I went and worked at Black & Decker for about nine months, uh, making snake lights, which was fun, making really good money. I worked again six and seven days a week doing that uh, to save up money and pay off some bills so I could go back to school. And that takes us up to the time that I worked at an Eckerd's in Greensboro. And that, I started working there in 1996. So I'm going to hope that this blends somewhat effortlessly into the second part, which that video clip is fine. So the next video clip, I'm going to be in the car. So it's going to sound a little different. But I wanted to record this with my computer so at least I have a chance of knowing that it won't be messed up. So, But it's getting late and I have somewhere I got to be. So... Thank you so much, and I'm going to now take you to the second half. Okay, well, I made, I did make a video in there in Target. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I kind of had like a plan A and a plan B. And plan A consisted of straightening up the candy section because people really love it when I do that. And, um, but I thought, you know, I, I went in here one time before, not not too long ago to do the candy section but it was all neat and tidy there was really nothing for me to do so I think I ended up just not doing anything like I saw that and I thought well I don't really feel like doing anything else so 
So anyway, I did that. I'll have to edit it though. Because the employees in Target, they have these little handheld devices that they use and they're constantly making noise like either a pinball machine or a video game. Bleep, bleep, jump, jump, her, her, bleep, bleep. Like just, there's just constant racket chirping and binging and bonging in the background from those stupid devices. There's a crow over here eating a carcass while he flew away. I just realized you didn't get to hear about the chicken carcass in the parking lot at Target. That was in the first clip and I realized I'm sitting here editing this and this, this video is going to take an eternity to finish. I'm even wearing totally different clothes now. Um, forgive me. I'm, but no, when I pulled up in the parking lot, out in the, in the space next to me, somebody had bought a rotisserie chicken somewhere and just decimated that thing. Like there was nothing left but some bones. Like there was like ribs and a backbone and they were just scattered on the parking lot with the container and a fork and a couple of napkins. Like, the hell kind of day was that person having? They ate the whole thing, except for like the backbone and some ribs. Like the rest of it was just gone. And they just left the, the bones in the parking lot. It was disturbing. <laughs> so that's why I was talking about a chicken carcass in the spot next to me. I just realized y'all don't know what the hell I'm talking about because that was in the first clip that was busted and doesn't work. Okay, get back to me now. So, yeah, I got it. I, I won't be able to edit all of it out. There was so much of it. If I edited it all out, the video would be like five minutes long. And all of a sudden, right in the middle of making that video, I got hungry. You ever do that? Like one minute you're fine and the next minute you're so hungry like I could about gnaw on that chicken carcass out there? Yes, I was fine and then I was fine one minute and then I wasn't fine anymore. I think a Porsche just ran over it. Yeah, shit, I was fine and then, and then all of a sudden, all right, come on. And then all of a sudden I was just starving like, oh my God, I have got to eat. And once I get like that, I have a hard time focusing on anything. Like, I can't concentrate. All I can think about is the fact that I'm hungry. And I have some leftovers at home. And I thought, well, I'll stop and get something to eat. But I thought, no. Eat the leftovers at home. I'm trying to, I'm trying to not end up with leftovers that get thrown out quite so often. I'm going to go home and eat leftovers from last night's dinner for lunch. That's what I'm going to do my plan and so now I have three videos to edit I have this one the one in Walmart and the one in Target so that will take up a good chunk of my afternoon but it is about lunchtime so I'm I'm starting to get hungry now Whew. so where was I so we were still talking about Eckerd's in Wilmington oh I forgot to tell you there was this one guy and he was a lot like the the lady in my neighborhood that something's you know she's got issues um there was this guy that would occasionally come in like that and if he came in and he was well you know groomed and you know he didn't stink like he would come in sometimes just smelling like he hadn't had a shower and you know he, he looked disheveled and, and we knew that he was going to start screaming whenever he came in the store like that he would just randomly start screaming at people it was usually the cashier i got the first time he ever screamed at me it scared me to death you know, I'm like 18, 19 years old the first time I encountered this guy, and it scared the hell out of me. I didn't even know what he was talking about. It was just like the neighbor, neighbor, my neighbor lady. It was just gibberish. Like, the stuff she was yelling at me, it just, it made no sense. She was just shouting just random stuff at me, and that's what this guy would do. He would just, it, it, you never knew when he was going to do it. You never knew who he was going to yell at. Sometimes he would yell at a customer scared them to death and one time he yelled at somebody's little kid and it was just oh my god so we got to the point with this guy whenever he came in we would just go ahead and call the security guard to come over because we would always have to have him escorted out like he wouldn't leave we would have to one a few times we had to call the cops because the security guard can only do so much we had to call the police on him more than a couple times because the security guard couldn't physically restrain him or anything and he was just going nuts like knocking shit over and just damaging things and screaming and yelling and it was scary I, I really every time he came in my heart would just drop and I would just get all you know whoa oh my 
my God, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? And you could usually tell by the way he looked whether or not he was going to have an episode. If his hair was combed and he, you know, if he looked like put together, usually he didn't really say or do anything. But if he came in and his hair was all crazy and he smelled like he hadn't had a shower in a month, yeah, that's when he was going to go off on somebody. So it, clearly he was having episodes of something. I, I don't know, but oh, that guy, he was a consistent customer throughout my three years working there. I mean, he was just consistently there. I don't know if he drove or if he lived nearby. I don't know, but he was in there. I'd say at least once a week he would come in and we would just automatically get on the phone. The security guard had like a little pager or something. You know, this was back in the early 90s. Cell phones were not super common back then. I mean, some people had them, but most people didn't. And we would page him to come over. Usually he was out back smoking. He was always, he was just, he smoked all the time. He was out in the back somewhere smoking and he would come in. And you could smell it on him like you were out there smoking. Sorry to interrupt your smoke break, buddy, but can you help? That guy's here. And, uh, yeah, it was a constant problem. So, but I really liked working in the pharmacy. And uh, it was, so I got down to my last few weeks there. I was getting ready to graduate and move away. And um, my pervy manager made one last attempt to like make something happen. And he, he said, you know, now that, you know, once you're not an employee here anymore, I can, I can say what I really want to say. And I said, please don't, please don't just stop. Cause I had been listening to this shit for three years and I just, I just said, just stop. No. The last day I came in, I still remember I had on these little corduroy shorts and these like peach colored tights and a sweater. And he looked me up and down like he wanted to eat me for lunch. And he said, you are so hot. And I, I just cannot, can I just have my check? And that was the last time I ever saw him. Like that was, that, that, that was our, those were our parting words. But can I have my check? Thank you. And peace out. Cause I'm not coming back here anymore. <laughs> um, I already had another job lined up to start the following Monday working in a Black & Decker factory, making really good money again, and I was working six days a week again through the summer after I graduated, because I was trying to save up some money. So I worked at Black & Decker for about nine months, and then I moved to Greensboro, and that's when, and I already had a job lined up there at one of the Eckerd's in Greensboro, and there I worked exclusively in the pharmacy. I never worked up front. I only worked as a pharmacy tech. And that was, that was all I did there. And I worked there for less than a year. And it was pretty non uneventful. That store didn't seem to have as much going on in it. It was kind of a boring store, which was fine by me. You know, it was fine by me that it was boring. And at that point, I was still, I was going to UNC Greensboro. Um, and I was only taking like one or two classes at a time and just paying for them as I went. Because I was trying, I didn't want any more debt. So I just paid for them as I went um, and worked at Eckerd's. I was working at Eckerd's maybe 30, 30 to 40 hours a week. And one day, a nurse came in to pick up her prescriptions. And she worked at one of the local hospitals. And she said, have you ever thought about hospital pharmacy working you know in in a hospital pharmacy I said no and I never really thought about it and she said well the hospital where I work is looking for pharmacy techs um, if you're interested um, it might be worth checking out if you're you know if you think you might be interested in it um, and she gave me the name and number of the person to call to talk to them about it and I thought well it wouldn't hurt to call them and you know just see what's up so I called the lady that she gave me the number for and said, yeah, and I gave her the nurse's name. This person said that you guys were looking for a text. And she said, we are. And I said, well, now I'm a retail, I work in retail pharmacy. I don't know how different that is. And she said, well, it is, it's pretty different. Um, but 
we will train you. We, you don't need to have prior experience. You will come in just as a trainee, you know, and um, we'll teach you everything you need to know. You know, don't, don't worry about not having experience. That's totally fine. So I, ca I went in for an interview, you know, just to meet face to face. And, um, oh, let me tell you, if you work in retail pharmacy and you haven't considered hospital pharmacy, first of all, there is a learning curve. In my opinion, hospital pharmacy is harder than retail pharmacy. That you, it takes more, it takes a wider skill base. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying it, it is different and it is, there is a much longer and larger learning curve working in hospital pharmacy in my opinion there are a lot of things especially once you get into IV admixture like doing IV bags and stuff like that there are all kinds of things that you have to learn um, but I know you could do it and most hospitals if they're looking for people they're willing to train you so I started anyway oh and the good thing too the pay is so much better and you don't have to deal with the general public you don't have to deal with customers anymore although you do have to deal with a lot of nurses and most nurses are awesome some of them are not um, but the pay is way better starting out as a trainee at the hospital I, I started out making more than twice as much as I was making working in retail my starting salary was more than double what I was making. And that was after working with Eckerd's off and on for over three years, almost four years. So it, it's, hey, look into it. There's no harm in checking it out. And I really liked it. Once I got it down, it took me probably about six months to feel fully comfortable with everything I had to do working in hospital pharmacy. It's, there's a lot to learn. It's, it's very different. Plus, the hospital I worked for was pretty big and they had a main pharmacy and two satellite pharmacies in different parts of the hospital and each the main pharmacy and the two satellites they all did different stuff so it's like each one had little specialties and things that if when you were working in there there were different things you had to be able to do um, there was the main pharmacy on the ground floor we had a satellite pharmacy on the second floor and a satellite on the fourth floor and uh, you have to learn what to do in every in every location, and every shift has different things they have to do. First, second, and third, they all kind of have different stuff that they have to do. So it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot to learn. But I'm telling you, I loved it. I did. I loved it. Man, that job was awesome. And I worked on the weekends quite a bit which meant I would have a day off during the week which I really liked um, and I st and I had no problem because I was only taking like one or two classes per semester so I had no problem scheduling you know getting classes you know where I could work with no problem and I worked second shift which I love second shift I miss working second shift so much I loved it I would go in usually either at 2 30 or 3 and I would work until 11 or 11.30, just depending on what time I came in. And I had 30 minutes for lunch. And oh, I loved it. I loved working at the hospital. Um, but once I finished my second degree at UNCG, see, I was only three credit hours shy of a double major at UNC Wilmington, but I was completely burnt out. I was burnt out. I was a research assistant. I worked at Eckerd's and I was going to school full time and I was just completely burnt out and I needed a break. So I decided, you know what, I'm done. But I was, I wanted to get away from Wilmington. I lived there for four years. I was ready to go. Nothing against Wilmington, but like I was ready to go. I didn't want to be there anymore. So I thought I, I'll just go to UNC. Well, I couldn't decide between UNC Charlotte and UNC Greensboro, but I'm not crazy about Charlotte, no offense, but the traffic and everything down there is just awful, so I didn't really want to live in Charlotte, so I decided to go with Greensboro, even though I didn't really know a whole lot about Greensboro, but I love it here, love it, so I decided I'll just finish up, but in order to graduate, you had to have at least 12 credit hours at the school, so I said basically you just need more of my money in order to let me graduate. 
You just don't have enough of my money yet. Okay. Well, I mean, as long as we're being up front, you know, let's just be honest. You don't have enough of my money yet. You need some more. So I took the last class I needed to finish my English degree, and then I just took three bullshit classes. I took a PE class. I took another English class, and I took a sociology class. And the PE class was fun. It was fun. It was early in the morning, and our, our instructor or professor or whatever she was was extremely tiny and extremely energetic. She was always very excited first thing in the morning. I'm like, lady, <laughs> calm down. I, I didn't get home from work till midnight last night. Settle down. I don't want to do jumping jacks. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> but I got through it. I think I ended up taking another class because I think that PE class was only like two credit hours or something. I don't know. Anyway, so that is a disjointed story about my time working at Eckerd. I worked, I did work three Christmas days in a row, but that was voluntary. That was another thing about the location where I worked. We were at that time, uh, in this was in the early 90s, we were basically the only store that was open on Christmas Day. And it was voluntary. You didn't have to work on Christmas Day if you didn't want to. But if you agreed to do it, they would pay you triple time to work. And I'm like, hell yeah. I'll work. I don't care. <laughs> I need the money. So um, I, I'm like, I'll work all day. Open to close. I won't even take a, I won't even take a 10 minute break. I want all the money. So I did. And I worked. Cr Christmas Day was always crazy. It was crazy busy from the moment we opened. We were open 9 to 5 on Christmas Day. Crazy busy. Um, God, it was non-stop. Everybody was coming in for batteries and wrapping paper. That was the two things that we would sell the most of on Christmas Day. Batteries and wrapping paper. And people were always so grateful that we were open. Like they bought a present for their kid and it needed batteries but they forgot the batteries. You know, or they had a really truly last minute gift wrapping going on. And people were frantic. They would run in and run out. So people running in and out all day long buying batteries and wrapping paper. And truly last minute gifts. Um, yeah, so it was it was always crazy. That day was always nuts. But we had plenty of help because everybody wanted that money. All the high school and college kids were working that day. And the store I worked in was the only one that was open Christmas Day. The other ones were not. Sometimes we'd have people from other stores in there working. On Christmas Day, I would work up front. The pharmacy part of the store, I believe, was closed. So, they didn't need anybody back there. But, uh, I would work up front. You know, helping run registers or, you know, bagging up stuff or helping customers find stuff. Whatever. And I always told them. It was funny. Oh, and, oh I gotta tell you about this lady. So, every year on Christmas Day, so we would open at 9 a.m., this one lady would come in right at nine. She did it all three of the years. She would come in and we would try to catch her, but there were there were one or two of those years we didn't see her come in because it was just crowded. You know, you don't see everybody. She would get a cart and fill it up with all the, the gift sets, the Christmas gift sets like perfumes and stuff like that. She would fill her cart completely full of that and wrapping paper and Christmas, just Christmas stuff. And then she would come up to the register and expect to get it all for half price. And we would have the same discussion with her every single year. We would say, ma'am, this stuff is not going to be half price until tomorrow. This is Christmas Day. And I'm thinking, go home and enjoy Christmas for the love of God. It's Christmas now. You're missing it to be in the store arguing with us. Go home and enjoy Christmas Day. No, she did it every year. And she would come in and she would go, well, it's after Christmas. Like, no, it is it is Christmas. We are in the present right now. It is not after Christmas until tomorrow. Well, I want, I should get it for half price because it's after Christmas. Christmas was at midnight. It's after Christmas. We would have the same argument every year. And John, fortunately, he worked Christmas all three years. And he would just have to tell her, ma'am. You're not getting it for half price. That's that's it. That you're not. No. 
and she would store them out and we'd have to put all that whole cart of stuff back up. Every, all three years, she would do it. One year, we did catch her at the door and just tell her, ma'am, do not fill this cart up with a bunch of stuff. You can if you want to pay regular price. I want it for half price. Well, you're not going to get it for half price. I mean, you know, you don't want to be a jerk, but it's like, ma'am, it's just not going to happen. I don't care what you want. You're not always going to get what you want in life. Has no one ever told you that? Life's not fair. I couldn't stand that old bitty. Like, what is wrong with you? Go home and enjoy Christmas Day for heaven's sake. Come back tomorrow. You can get all this stuff for half price. My God. Every year. Every year. And another interesting thing I noticed. Now, this was in the Wilmington Walmart. I think it also applied to the one in Greensboro. I think it came up there, too. The two main things people came in there looking for that we didn't have was shelf paper and shower curtain liners, like shower curtains. They, they, <laughs> people would come in asking for shelf paper and shower curtains. And we didn't sell shelf paper or shower curtains. And we would just have to tell them, you know, sorry, we don't have it. And I told, I told the district manager one time he was in there and I said, if I may, I have a suggestion. And now I know Clearwater, the Clearwater main office determines that, you know, where everything is placed in the store and how things are laid out. I know y'all have planograms and all that stuff, but I'm going to tell you now, just from working in here, if you set up just a little section, just a kiosk or the end of a, the end cap thing or whatever, set up a section for shelf paper and shower curtain liners or shower curtains, you'd sell all of them you could get because people come in here all the time looking for those two things and we don't have them. They never took my advice. They never did it. I said, I'm telling you, you could, you could charge whatever you wanted and people would pay it. For some reason, tons of people come in here looking for those two things. And it's funny too, because people will come in and they would ask, you know, where's your shelf paper? I'm sorry, we don't carry shelf paper. And then they would challenge me. They would say, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm pretty sure I've bought shelf paper in here before. I'd say, well, I've worked here for a while and we haven't had it in the entire time I've been here. Ooh, it's smoky. I don't know if you can see that haze. It is smoky right here. Good God, it's all smoky. Well, you know, there was that, that fertilizer plant in Winston-Salem blew up. It, it's not that. No, this smells like somebody's burning leaves or something. It's very, God, it's thick. Look back there how thick it is. Ugh. Dang. No, it smells like somebody's burning leaves. I'm about to get online and figure out what this is. This is crazy. It looks foggy, but it's not, it's not fog. It's smoke. I can smell it. No, it's not the thing in Winston. Although that was horrible. They had to evacuate like 6,000 people when that fertilizer plant, plant caught on fire. I don't know if there was an explosion or not, but they were afraid there was going to be. So anyway, people would challenge me about shelf paper and shower curtains. And they would say, no, I'm pretty sure I've bought them here before. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm going to walk around to see if I can find them. I said, okay. Let me know if you do, because it'll be news to me. I've, I hang out working in this store about every day, and I've never seen them anywhere. But let me know if you find them. And they'd sneak out, like, mm -hmm. I tried, I tried, though. I tried to get them, to, like, you, just try it. Shelf, cur shelf paper and shower curtain liners. Set up a section with those two things, and I think you'd be surprised how much of it you'd sell. Everybody's looking for that. I don't know why people think Eckerd is the place for that, but they, they did. So, I guess overall, I was it was a good place to work, mainly because they were willing to work with my schedule. Although Robert, or John, the, the jerk, the, another thing about him too, he was, he was always like, you're coming into work, right? Like we had a lot of hurricanes and whatnot, and we'd have, you know, like the streets would be flooded. He's like, you coming in work, right? Like, yeah, if I can find a damn canoe. But I would always get there in my little car, like praying to God, like, please don't get, let me get swept away. 
in this water. You know, and I, I, I got into work. I always made it. I never, the only time I ever left, one time I had a sinus, no, I had um, strep throat. It was sick as a dog and I had to leave early and he gave me hell for that. I said, well, I, do you want me to stay here and, you know, get cooties on everything? I'm sick. I, I got to go home. I feel awful. He, he always made me feel bad, you know, for any little thing. He was always complaining. And then he'd make his pervy remarks. It's like, you're doubly awful. You criticize me all the time, and then you say the stuff you say. You're like, ugh. You're just revolting. Anyway, that's my days working at... What the hell am I doing? I, I don't even know where I'm going. That's my days working at the... Eckerd, working at Eckerd Drugs. And it was good for me, but I'm really glad that nurse came along and recommended hospital pharmacy because that was way better. So if you work retail pharmacy or you're just looking for a change, I would recommend checking out hospital pharmacy, seriously. Yeah, it's definitely awesome. So that's it, and I hope you have a fantastic day, and I will see you again really soon.